Good afternoon, and welcome to the Fisher Library's bi-weekly video podcast series, Between the Pillars, the series where you get to find out a bit more about our library, our collections, and our staff. Uh, this is episode number five, and the last one of 2020. My name is John Shoesmith, and I'm the outreach librarian here at Fisher. And again, I say here, even though I'm technically not at the library, but rather in my home office uh, in the West End of Toronto. As some of you might know, the city has been hit hard by a second wave of uh, COVID-19 infections. So we thought it would be prudent to do the last two sessions remotely rather than share a space at the library. But as you can see, my colleague PJ Carefoot is at Fisher and he's the final participant uh, between the pillars for 2020. So welcome, PJ. Um, for those that don't know PJ, he's the head of the Rare Books and Special Collections Department at the University of Toronto. And actually, PJ, I was thinking this morning that in terms of our current staff, uh, you're my longest standing colleague at Fisher. I uh, believe that is the case. Because you, you were there at 20, 2005 when I first started working at the library that summer. So uh, so 15 years. That's right. Um, so for this last episode of the year, being so close to the holiday season, and just a reminder, our research and reference services will be closed for the remainder of 2020, beginning on Wednesday, December 23rd. We wanted to focus on a topic that is near and dear to many of us, and that's Christmas. And to highlight just a few of the Christmas theme materials that we hold at Fisher, um, in that spirit, I'm wearing uh, my own holiday, you probably can't see it very well, but my own holiday, holiday theme sweater, uh, this lovely cardigan, which has reindeers. It's not one of those ugly Christmas jumpers, but I think it still captures the spirit of the, of the season. So now PJ, PJ is our ideal guide for this since every December for the past number of years, he's curated a selection of Christmas related materials in our monthly display case in our exhibition area. And that must be going back Five, six years now? PJ? 2014 was the first year. 2014. So, so, so unfortunately, we didn't get to do it this year. Um, but I'm going to, I'll say this right now. We have an online exhibition of all of PJ's previous past Christmas uh, theme materials that uh, I will share with you in, on, in the YouTube comments section um, as well. You'll be able to find it on our Fisher website. So, but and PJ, I hope I'm not betraying your confidence when I mention, um, when I have, a, I have a sense of what Christmas means to you, because when you used to work in our shared workspace, uh, the phone would ring, I believe, every 24th day of every month. And that call was from your father to remind you, I think it was from your father, to remind you was that it was such and such months until it was Christmas Eve. Is, is that about right? That is exactly the case. And uh, still to this day, I get a phone call or an email at some point on the 24th day of every month saying it's 11 months till Christmas Eve or something like that. Yeah, it was always a very, very important thing for uh, for my family. So I was going to say, I was going to say that maybe you could expand upon that a little bit. I mean, so, so to tell us exactly what Christmas has meant to you over the years. Well, you know, for our family, I, you know, not to, to make it sound maudlin, but my family didn't have an awful lot of money. We, uh, we grew up at, uh, I grew up at the corner of Greenwood and Queen, and that was before that part of the city had, was up and coming, believe me. And uh, we didn't have an awful lot, but somehow my parents always come Christmas time, uh, poured into that, uh, that holiday, um, in a sense, everything, not just the financial, but the, the, the everything that went right. into into the holiday and uh, so it's always been very very special for uh, for me for my sisters uh, my mother is no longer with us but also for my dad it's still right. incredibly important and full of wonderful wonderful memories i guess this year is going to be a little tougher then in terms of uh, you know the celebration of, of the season it will we uh, we won't be able to get together as we normally would but uh, next year is going to be so much uh, so much bigger and better right so what i want to do on this particular session is i want i want to lean heavily on the um on the show and tell aspect, because we've brought a lot of really cool things um, to show. And as I said, this, these, all of these materials are also on the online exhibition, um, which you can all check out. Um, but maybe let's start, um, I'm not, not, not sure entirely the, uh, the order we're gonna go in, but let's start, I think, with the oldest item that you have. Um, Absolutely, you so I'll switch, I'll switch, switch camera switch. now so that we can take a look at it. But the, the oldest thing that we are going to be seeing is uh, this copy of the Book of Hours. Right. Um, now, books, books of hours were prayer books uh, that were uh, used uh, in the Middle Ages. And this particular one dates from about the year 1440, somewhere around there. Okay. And uh, typical of the, in, in books of hours, there was a program that went with the way in which illustrations, if it had illustrations, the way in which illustrations were included in the, uh, in the books of hours. They always were the same 16 or so that were right. included. And among them, not surprisingly, uh, you will find quite often, well, pretty much all the time, you will find 
the image of the nativity itself. And so that's a good place to start, given that although the, the Christmas festivities are actually much, much older, uh, go back to those ancient winter celebrations um, that you find in Rome and Northern Europe and all around the Northern um, Hemisphere long before Christianity came along. For, for no, people that don't know, actually, just for people that don't know, maybe you can explain what, what a Book of Hours actually is. Sure. So Book of Hours, um, if, if, if you were, didn't really want to go up to the cathedral or the abbey or the monastery to take part in the liturgy, the liturgy, the services that take place uh, every, every day, eight times in a monastery, eight times every day, beginning really in the middle of the night and then going through until the last, uh, the last office, as they call it, which is just before you go to bed. Um, if you didn't want to you know, trundle your way up to the monastery every day eight times. Instead, what they did was they, they created these, these um, abbreviated forms of the official liturgy, and you could uh, celebrate them from the comfort of your own home. And these were particularly popular with, uh, with women right. uh, to be able to participate. And not all books of hours look like this one by any far stretch of the imagination. This is a really deluxe version of, of a book of hours. And so what you're looking at there, I don't know if you can see the gold kind of, if I, maybe if mm -hmm. I reach a little bit, you can see the gold kind of shimmers. Right. Um, this, this is a really deluxe book of hours. It's called the Vifui book of hours and would have cost, you know, someone at the court of Paris, the equivalent of one year's uh, rent, say from, from the farms that they own, one year's wages. It's a very, very expensive book. Um, not all are like that. Most are very plain. This just happens to have ones that we wanted to use to illustrate the, uh, the, the Christmas story. So here, of course, you have the, uh, the nativity, Mary, uh, Joseph, uh, the baby uh, lying in the manger, and in behind you can see a cow. But, I mean, incredible, incredible work of art. Right. Um, we, we believe that this was done by a disciple of the Bedford Master. We're not 100% sure. But if you look up Bedford Master in, uh, in Google, you'll find out all about him. He did uh, some remarkable works in Paris, as this one was done in the 15th century. Um, but as I say, this is this, so popular, of course, are images like this that we associate with the Christian story um, of, of um, the nativity that, and of Christmas that, of course, uh, they end up being Christmas cards in and of themselves. Right. To give you an example of that. I think we might have turned one into a Christmas card. We have. Card. I'm just going to show you okay. this one here. Surprisingly, not the nativity, but this one, uh, okay. the shepherds. Uh, okay. that's, uh, that became one of the university's uh, Christmas cards, oh, probably right. 10, 12 years ago now. But uh, it, 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 again, beautiful. Each one a beautiful work of art in its own right. That, that's not our only example of a of book of hours in our collection, is that right? No, it's not. We have uh, we have numerous uh, books of hours now in the, in the collection, and it's, it's something that we continue to grow. Um, people are probably aren't aware of this, but uh, we support uh, the department, the Center for Medieval Studies, uh, in their education um, programs. And right. one of the uh, important courses that is taught through them is the course on liturgy, uh, right. medieval liturgy. And so uh, we've been adding over time uh, various other liturgical books to uh, our collections to support the work of Professor Hain right now, but um, a number of other professors uh, who work in that uh, in that particular department. So it's a growing area for us. Even, even I even I never get tired of, of holding those and, and showing those off. They are so beautiful. They truly yeah. beautiful. Yeah. So, so let, let's jump a little farther now into the, I think we're going to the 19th century. Yeah, we're going to go to the 19th century. So, and, and, and something that's so, so, something that some most of us will be familiar with. Absolutely. So, uh, of course, one of the things that happens over this period of the the holidays is uh, people read and tell stories to one another, and have been doing so for 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 centuries. Um, here you see the 1843 edition of Dickens' A Christmas Carol. Now, it, it came out in 1843, right. and uh, the first edition came out in 1843, and so popular was that book. And, and this is kind of interesting because most of us think of Dickens as, as publishing things in, in installments that would be published in newspapers. That's not the case with A Christmas Carol. A Christmas Carol right. was published as a book, right. and novella, really. And uh, 1843, it was so popular that they had to print a second edition. So this one that I'm showing you here is actually the second edition, as wow. you can see right there at the, at the bottom of the title page um, of, of the story of a, of a Christmas Carol. And one of the things that I always love about it the, are the uh -huh. illustrations. Yeah. And uh, here you can see the frontispiece. Um, these were done by John Leach. And John Leach was an illustrator with Punch magazine, those of mm -hmm. you who know that. And here, of course, you, you, without even, if you know the story, you know who this is. This is Mr. Fezigwig and his wife uh, dancing in the warehouse after he shut down everything and, and uh, calls all of his clerks to, uh, to, to the Christmas Eve party. Um, 
the the illustrations in this are as influential, I would say, as the text. Because right. if you if you think about the dramatizations that have taken place since uh, the first 1843 publication, most uh, famously, of course, the 1951 um, movie with uh, starring Alistair Sim, mm -hmm. they they base the characters the way you see them in the film uh, mm -hmm. look leeches uh, depictions so here of course as I say Fezziwig and if we if we turn it to uh, the ghost of Christmas uh, present you can't it's unmistakable even the way the room is set up is exactly the way you would find it in the 1951 film and right. similar with other films that have come out at different times uh, Scrooged even Scrooged uh, follows a kind of uh, mm -hmm. this similar pattern even though with an updated version and of course the uh, the famous depiction um, of right. the the spirit of, of, of Christmas yet to come, this this um, a wraith like specter. I mean, these are all the ways in which we still think of the story of a Christmas Carol down to to this day. 18. Would this have been an expensive book when it was first published? No, not overly expensive at the time. It would have been the the, the same cost as as would it would have been for any kind of novella of the period. Um, of course, today the, the 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 it's a far more expensive book to buy in the in the right. tens of thousands of dollars to get a first edition. Um, but it's a, a beautiful, one of the things I like about this one, however, is that they have bound, oh, whoever, wow. whoever rebound it, you can see it was rebound yeah. probably in the in 19th, beginning of 20th century, bound into it the original covers, which huh. John knows this is something we all love here at the Fisher to see the uh, original provenance as best yeah. you can. Even the spine has been uh, very lovingly preserved at the, at the back. So that's uh, some pretty amazing foresight into uh, what we would want as a, as rare book librarians. It really is. It really is. But a, a great, great, obviously a great story. And one, I still read it every year um, right. at some over the Christmas holidays. Yeah. And I think telling about its uh, endurance as a story is that um, we have other works of, uh, of um, a Christmas Carol, um, including, I think a barbarian press one out of mission. Beautiful BC. Barbarian. One. Yeah. So again, I think I think that one is also on the uh, online ex exhibition it's, as well. It is. You can see the illustrations in that are particularly particularly fine. But uh, yeah. in that tradition of great illustrations that that come out of this uh, out of the story, it just lends itself to to uh, to illustration and dramatization. So I think the next thing we have is is all is all illustration, if I'm not mistaken. That's right. So this is one of our recent acquisitions. Cover is not particularly interesting looking. Right. Um, but uh, this is a, a watercolor album that was done between the years 1854 and 1856, and specifically, it was done by um, it was specifically it was done by a um, a visitor to Canada. This was someone who um, he and his wife, uh, his name was Graham, Mr. Graham. He and his wife came to Canada to visit their friends right. uh, who were living in Guelph, and uh, so. He, you know, when you think in 1854, this isn't a small trip. This right. is like get on a ship from Liverpool, take right. X number of weeks to get to, you know, Halifax or wherever, and then cross the, half the continent to get to uh, um, Upper Canada. So, not surprisingly, they stayed for two years, which is a little long to stay as a house guest, but at any rate, they <laughs> did. And uh, it, all through this, uh, this album, he, he was happily, he was a, a wonderful artist. And he does these these great wow. depictions of what he saw in Canada, especially in the winter time um, during uh, during his, the stay of his visit. So, for example, one of the images uh, I hope you can see down here at the bottom um, is Mr. Graham, and he's attending the uh, the New Year's Day levy in mm -hmm. uh, government house in uh, in in um, in Toronto. Um, here you see some of the activities that would take place, certainly around the Christmas holidays and throughout the winter, um, ice boating. And right. you see people skating on the harbor, the, the Toronto Harbor. Here you see boats frozen in the harbor just outside of uh, uh, of the um, St. Lawrence Hall. And mm -hmm. again, here you have people on sleds uh, crossing the, the the Toronto Harbor. And here playing, I'm not sure, but I think it's lacrosse. Uh, okay. The puck looks a little, or whatever too, the, the too ball. Round. To me, looks yeah a little bit too much to be, but who knows? Maybe maybe it is. Maybe it is hockey. Who knows? Right. Um, one of the things I find most interesting. I hope you can see. It. Can you see the image here at the very bottom? Yep. Yep. Okay. So this 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 uh, the caption says bringing in the Yule log. Now, right. most of us today think of the Yule log as a dessert, a chocolate thing that you know <laughs> have over the Christmas holidays. That was not the tradition though. And what I find interesting is that. That, this tells us that in 1854, 1855, the tradition of burning a Yule log in Canada was still going on. 
right. I mean, it's just happened now, to, not too much, but when, when this tradition comes originally from Northern Europe before the Christian period, and then spreads throughout Europe to England, Ireland, more so England, um, and the tradition was that you would cut down a tree, a whole tree, and right. you would then bring it into your home, and you would stick the fat end of the tree into your fireplace, and right. you would start burning it, and it would burn over the 12 days of Christmas. Mm. And as it burned, you just kept pushing the log into your fireplace. You would collect the ashes, and then after Christmas Day, you would throw the ashes into your garden. You never, ever throw them out on Christmas Day itself. That was considered bad luck. But mm. after Christmas Day, you could throw, um, start throwing them out. But from between the period 24th to the 6th of January, you just kept burning that log. So this is a great indication to us that, that the fire kept on going, even here in, in Upper Canada. And here you see some of the other activities that uh, you, know, you associate with the winter. This one is a, an oddity. He, uh, he depicts here a funeral procession. You can oh, see the, right. the hearts on on uh, on rails on skis. Here is the funeral making its way to the church. Um, here you have a variety of different sleighs that would still be uh, would, would be used in uh, Upper Canada in the 1850s, and he identifies them: wooden sleighs, wooden cutters, the differences between them. And then among my favorites here, you have this beautiful one of King Street uh, in front of the St. Uh, Lawrence Hall. Yeah. You can still identify that today yeah. as being yeah. King. Um, and people decked it's decked out for for the holidays here you have the the mail coach that is making its way to uh, between Guelph and Georgetown uh, just really really truly charming illustrations of what uh, Canada would have looked like at the time middle of the of the uh, 18th century middle of the 19th century before confederation yeah i think i think you were actually you were guessing what question i was going to ask you which is you know the the tr there, even though it's beautiful to look at i mean what is the kind of research value of something like this it's incredible because when you as you're going through it he's got maps uh, he, he's got um, creeks that no longer exist mm -hmm. uh, because we've built over them um, he's got interiors all these things interior of train coaches um, map here of Toronto. There are right. all, sorts of, all sorts of things that he has included in this that give us uh, the inside of an ice house. Um, mm -hmm. Things that we don't have, uh, or there are very few illustrations of, if there are any at all. Lovely one here of Trinity College. Right. Yep. The, the old Trinity College, not the not the current yeah. one. So wow. it, it's a wonderful document uh, that shows us what uh, Toronto, Guelph, uh, Bradford, a number of places that he goes around to, were like in that in that pre-Confederation period. What a find! And yet also, you have to make all sorts of inferences as you're looking at them. But you know, why is 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 uh, you know a sleigh in this particular uh, form? Um, it, one of the questions that it had often has is you'll see that some of them are not particularly nice images. No, that's true. Depictions of uh, people, members of the uh, black community here in Toronto. Um, on the one hand, it, it shows us that the black community was here in Toronto at that time, but the right. caricaturish nature of it tells us the way in which this person thinks about um, the, the, the black community at that time. So all these things are, it's a, it's a, it's a, a tremendous document for being able to understand uh, the culture. I was going to say, this might be an ideal candidate to get uh, digitized in full. Absolutely. <laughs> I, actually, it has been. I think we, yes, we, I already have one digitized. Yep. It's Perfect. Already been digitized. Yeah. So let's move on to, um, I don't know what you're going to show next, actually. <laughs> so surprise me. Yeah, so as long as we're staying in, uh, in, in uh, that Victorian period, uh, why not look at a few uh, Christmas cards of the period? Perfect. So for example, now think back and to these what are I just, I we should, These are something when we go to antiquarian book fairs, we're always looking for. That's right. So if you, if you think back to um, uh, what I said a few moments ago about the uh, Christmas Carol, a Christmas Carol was was first published in 1843. Right. 1843 is also the year the first Christmas card is ever made in England. Oh, okay. And um, in Canada, we start to pick up on that by the 1860s, 1870s. These particular cards, beautiful chromolithographs, really, when you think about it, um, they uh, are are the original Christmas cards in, that have Canadian origins. 18 these are these ones are from the 18 1870s. And uh, one of the things you'll notice is that there are no religious depictions in these. Right. These are all depictions of the Canadian um, environment. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're, they're, they're very much a focus on this being a winter celebration. Right. Um, for the most part, however, this one does say a happy Christmas on it. But the majority of our cards um, will say a happy new year. Most of them say a happy new year, the ones that we have. And I think part of the reason for that is 
twofold. Part of it is because most of these were printed in Montreal. Okay. And in Montreal, the, the two dominant cultures, of course, you have the French. Mm -hmm. and the other dominant culture in Montreal that we don't often think about are the Scots. Right. And for the Scots and for the French, New Year is of greater importance or was of greater importance than Christmas was. Christmas was a religious celebration. New Year was a, a festive, more festive, secular kind of celebration. So I think that helps us understand why so many of the, of, of the cards uh, don't reference Christmas itself or, or specifically the New Year. And I think it has to do with the culture of Montreal at the time. But they're hmm. beautiful, beautiful examples of um, of of ephemeral um, printing in, in Canada and how quickly the Christmas card or the holiday card catches on in, in this country. One of the other things you'll notice is that they are not cards in the way that we think of them. They are right. postcards. Yeah. And stay as postcards really until about the really the beginning of the 20th century. Interesting. Is, is there, you have something else that's Canadian? Yeah. As well. um, one other thing, that, another tradition that has kind of died uh, in in well, certainly since the beginning of the 20th century, is the carrier boys. Ah, yeah. Now, for those of you who don't know, the carrier boy specifically refers to what we would call the paper boy. Yeah. And the, the paper boys in the 19th century, very beginning of the 20th century, they depended on this particular publication to see them get their wages. And mm -hmm. what it is, here you see the carrier boy of the Picton Gazette. This is the 1871. And inside is an annual address that has been, it's in poetry, and it, it tackles um, current events in, in Canada and around the world. And this one's particularly important for, it, it, it refers to, uh, for example, very specifically, without giving the name, the sheriff has died. And oh. so there's this sort of encomium to, right. to the sheriff that is recorded in here. But it also has reference, for example, 1870 is the year that um, the Pope uh, is in council is declared um, to be infallible. And there is a little paragraph in there about that. There is a little stanza about Queen Victoria. There are other stanzas about uh, different different news items that have happened through the year. And so people would give the, the carrier boy uh, a few coins. And this was in large part what he depended on um, to to have an income for for right. for your so the idea of tipping your 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 uh, postman or, or your uh, um, po uh, your paper boy goes back a very very long way. But these Canadian these this tradition uh, disappears really at the beginning of the 20th century. But the, it was a great tradition while it lasted. The survivability too of those is probably you know, oh yeah. very few. They're 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 so ephemeral. Yeah. So ephemeral. Uh, one other thing that, that when I'm thinking of it, I, I, I discovered this. Some of you, some of you may recall, oh. uh, when I was a boy on CFRB, every morning during the month of December, uh, about ten o'clock, about nine thirty, ten o'clock in the morning, on would come the choir from Simpsons, the Simpsons, mm -hmm. down at the corner of Queen and Young Street, and they printed these little leaflets with the carols, uh, uh, right. uh, carols on them. This is a promotional thing, obviously. They wanted right. to draw people into the store. But these uh, little sheets were printed in the thousands, tens, 20, 30,000, and they'd be distributed to hospitals and churches and schools and all this kind of stuff. And again, talking about ephemeral, a few of them still survive, like like this right. one. Yeah. Uh, but there, there were a great bit of advertising, but they also got people, as I say, every morning, 10.30, you'd have your radio on and you'd listen to the music. And, and it really gave you a sense that... Uh, um, Christmas wasn't just something in your own home. That this was something that was happening all through your city, and you felt connected to people uh, all around you. Well, looking at that it makes me nostalgic for the uh, the Simpsons displays they used to have as well. Yeah, well, yeah, the Bay still has them, but I, I, I you know. But they rely a little too heavily sometimes on the Bay, you know, the the Bay colors. I had some Bay right. colors. Yes, exactly, exactly. Yeah. The Simpsons ones. They were, and kids would line up and stand in front of those windows, and all the mechanics. It was terrific. Exactly. So this is, this is, I think, the last item we're going to show. It is. It is. There's so much more that you can look at it online, yes. but this is the last. Um, this is a visit from St. Nicholas. And yeah. if I recall correctly, I think we've got the entire thing online, so you can yeah. read it in its entirety. And here you say this is obviously not the first edition, nowhere near the first edition. Right. Clement <laughs> Moore writes at the beginning of the uh, 19th century. But this one's an important edition done in 1921. 
Um, it's important because it was um, the, 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 the man responsible for it was a, a man named Bruce Rogers. And Bruce Rogers was one of the greatest typesetters, uh, book designers. Um, he, he just produced incredibly beautiful books. And this is the, the, the one from 1921, uh, published by the uh, um, Atlantic Monthly Press. Now, one of the reasons why I think it's, why I particularly like this book, is you'll see at the very end, it's a minor little detail, but it says these wood, the woodcuts are by Florence Wyman Ivins. Mm. Now, why this is important is that Florence Ivins was the very first woman ever to have her own show at the Metropolitan Museum uh, of Art in, in, uh, in New York City. And she is the one that's responsible for these. They're subtle, um, but they're incredibly beautiful uh, uh, illustrations. Um, remarkable, remarkable thing to 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 uh, to behold, really. I just love the size of that book as well. It's a perfect size. And the other thing I love about it is the type. As I say, um, uh, Rogers was known for his uh, for creating beautiful types. Right. And uh, here, you know, to have this particular uh, book in in this format, I think is is just tremendous. So. It's it's a it's a it's a nice way to end off our our, our little uh, our little exhibition. I, I should remind people as well that we have an entire Bruce Rogers exhibition online as well. That's uh, right. Uh, where you can see up to eighty to ninety of his works. So yeah, and it, again, again, I don't know, but uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's beautiful. Absolutely. So why don't, why don't we go back on camera? Okay, I'm coming. I'll just switch over again. So that was great. I mean, and basically, I mean, you're only. You were only just scratching the surface there. Oh, uh, yeah. Kind of I think we, have, we, have. We, we must have about 80 items, I think, in the online exhibition. Right. And, and, just, we're all, and we're always trying to grow those as well. We are. You know, I mean, this is this is a reflection of one festival that uh, we're, we're highlighting for, for this year. Um, but, but of course, there's so many other things that couldn't be included in this because they don't exist or because right. people have selected them. It, it very much, our collections very much depend on uh, the things that people in the past have collected and have right. decided to preserve and then out of their generosity give to us. And, uh, you know, what I would, you know, I often get asked, uh, you know, can we uh, do something for Hanukkah? I would love right. to do something for Hanukkah. The problem is that those things aren't in our collections yet. Um, I'm, I'm really hoping, uh, and that's the same with, you know, so many of the other festivals that, um, you know, our, 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 our traditionally our donors um, right. have been uh, Anglo-Saxons or, or right. Irish and or Scottish, or, you know, and, and so as a result, that's the that's the, with the focus of what has come into the library. But um, certainly my hope is that, you know, 25, 50, 100 years from now, uh, the, uh, the, that the library will have uh, enlarged its collections to represent all those various other cultures and, and, and traditions. So that if somebody says, can we have an exhibition on X, Y, or Z, we can say, yeah, we have material for that. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing, right? I mean, with the, as you say, you've said in the past that it really does cover specific sort of tradition. Um, and, and there's definitely a hole to be filled there in terms of understanding um, collecting materials around other cultures, around other religious festivals, that type of thing. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah libraries are windows into history. Right. It's not, it, they don't just hold history. They are windows into history. And so they're a snapshot for, for what people considered worthy of, of preservation. Alberto Mangel has this wonderful expression. He, he talks about the shadow library. Right. That's the library that we don't have. Right. And, you know, and, and, we, but, and yet we, that we value. And, right. and hope is that, that we can, in time, bring that library out of the shadows and right. uh, make it accessible to the general public. That's great. Anyway, PJ, this has been a fantastic, uh, fantastic, fantastic little show and tell about some of the materials we have here. Um, uh, so that basically wraps up our 2020 episodes of Between the Pillars. Uh, we hope you've enjoyed this series. Um, I've really enjoyed actually participating in it, and I've learned so much as well um, from the different people we've had on, the different collections we've been showing. So we are putting together the uh, slate of uh, participants for 2020. So we will send that out to uh, to our friends community and it'll be available on our website. But in the meantime, all of us at Fisher want to wish everybody a happy and wonderful and peaceful holiday season. It's going to be a different one for a lot of us. And uh, we look forward to next year when vaccine willing, uh, we'll again to be able to welcome you inside our beautiful building. Um, and hopefully when PJ will be doing another Christmas exhibition and you'll be, able to see it, you'll be able to see it in person this time. So in the meantime, take care everybody. Um, thanks again for uh, watching this series. Um, please watch us again next year as well. And we'll see you in the new year.